but welcome to the second the second New York author series lecture for the 22-2023. My name is Kevin Garawal. I am the Andrew H. and Janet H. Neely Dean of the University of Rochester. I'm so happy to be here this evening and see all of you here as well. Here and then the Neely series was established in 2001 to invite a diverse range of authors to discuss their recent publications, their writing process, and the ideas presented in their work. The series is made possible by the River Campus Libraries through the endowed fund provided by University Life Trustee Andrew H. Neely and his wife, Jan. Today, we are thrilled to announce a partnership between the Neely Author Series and the Department of Psychiatry. The River Campus Library dedicates this year's Neely Author Series to the Department of Psychiatry's 75th anniversary. This book, the book highlighted in this, the books highlighted in this year's series support key concepts in the biopsychosocial model which the University of Rochester, Drs. George Engel and John Romano developed decades ago and continue to serve as the cornerstone of education and training across the psychiatry. I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to the e-newsletter Power Talk to stay informed about the library news and upcoming events including future lectures in the Neely series, a link to, the, to subscribe will be part of my Momentarily, we will welcome our speaker, Erin Gerber. Oh, to speak about her book and her life as an author. Following her lecture, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Those on Zoom, please submit questions via the Q&A function. And Darren will answer as many questions as time allows. Feel free to submit questions during the lecture or during the Q&A. And Erin has offered to sign books for everyone. You can purchase her books immediately following. We have with us today a special person to introduce the keynote speaker. Mike Osier grew up in Rochester, graduated from Brighton High School, and visits his family and friends often in the area. With a BA in philosophy and an MBA, recently retired as the Assistant Director of Public Health for Riverside County. He won numerous state and national awards for his groundbreaking work in public health and appeared on NPR's All Things Considered and on virtually every TV station in the greater Los Angeles area. Michael met our keynote speaker more than five years ago in Vancouver, Columbia when she was honored to receive the prestigious Golden Gavel Award from Toastmasters International. Since then, he has had our speaker present at, at an important community event in Southern California on childhood trauma, and he presented her, her foundation for Freedom Writers Foundation with the Toastmasters Corporate Award for their work in supporting the community and helping their team find their voice and tell their stories. Three years ago, he helped Freedom Writers celebrate their 20th, 20th year anniversary and has donated generously to the community. Join me in welcoming the person who will introduce our series, Kim <laughs> Osher's brother, who helps run the Neely series, Mike Osher. Thank you, Kevin. The way to get a great introduction is to write it yourself. <laughs> Our speaker did not write the next introduction, I did. <laughs> Our speaker tonight has earned an award-winning reputation for her commitment to the future of education. Her impact a teacher, as a teacher is amazing and is exemplified in the movie Freedom Riders. And can you imagine Hilary Swank played her? Unbelievable. Her educational philosophy values and promotes diversity. She encourages her students to rethink rigid beliefs about themselves and others and to reconsider their own daily decisions and ultimately, ultimately to rechart their own future. Our speaker founded the Freedom Writers Foundation and she currently all over the country and all over the world and in fact, recently was in the Middle East, Israel and Palestine, where she got Israelis and Palestinian students to work together. Her students have appeared on, and Aaron have appeared, appeared on many, many 
programs, including unbelievably, right? Barb, right? Is this what this <laughs> uh, County Chung, Oprah, just to name a few. You see out there the Freedom Riders Diary and the Dear Freedom Riders books, and there's many books that she's written for teachers. Yeah. I did hear from She you. is a BA and a master's from UC Irvine, that's University of California, Irvine, and Cal State Fullerton, Long Beach, sorry. And she's been honored with the Toastmasters Golden Gavel that you just heard about, and in addition, the Anne Frank Award. I've known our speaker for more than five years. We've spoken together all over California. I've, I've met many of the original Freedom Riders. And when I sit in the front row, I always cry when they speak. So I'm counting on you guys to have some tears. <laughs> Speaking on Catalyst for Change, welcome our speaker, published author, master teacher, and inspiration for all, Aaron Gruwal. <laughs> Michael forgot to announce. We're a technical difficulties here. Michael forgot to announce that he also bought an entire box of books for the amazing students today at East High. And I just want to take a moment to applaud him and his sister. Okay. For They also participated in the line game with these amazing students. And Michael boldly asked a question that took his breath away. And I'm glad that you did that. So we are here in your backyard, in your community. And I'm, I'm just so excited. And for those of you on Zoom, what you can't see is the front row of the most amazing students and scholars. So I hope that you are envious at home that you don't get to see what I get to see. Um, students who are sending their college applications out into the world, places like Columbia and NYU and the University of Rochester, just to name a few. So I want to talk about those moonshot moments when young people dare to dream and dream big. And I had just that, those, those moonshot moments with my students who dared to dream and had no idea that they were going to graduate no idea they were going to go to college, no idea they would travel the world, become authors, and as I like to refer to them, accidental activists. But maybe it was accidentally on purpose. So for those of you that are not familiar with our story, what I'd like to do is begin with a little segment from the Today Show. This was on the heels of the 20th anniversary of the Freedom Writers Diary, which just translates to when I'm in classes with middle school kids, they often say, um, you look a lot older than that woman in the movie. <laughs> when they start doing the math that a book, a book is in its 20th anniversary. And, and what that means is this book has been around for a while, a couple decades a while. And so what I'd like to do is as a way to introduce you to our story, this is a preview of our Freedom Writer story.
So for those of you that are not in this room, uh, those of you that are watching all the way in California, my whole Freedom Rider family back in California are watching. In my, hand, in my hand is a copy of our book. And the gaggle of students in the front row all got a book tonight, not from me, but from the fine folks of this community and in this audience. And it's ironic that we are in a library in a university and, and I'm holding a book by young people who didn't like reading, who didn't like writing, who didn't like me, and somehow, some way found their voice to use words and not weapons to change their story. So this book in a library means a lot to me because I have found out that this is the number one most stolen book out of the library system in America. <laughs> and I, I'm not recommending anybody on Zoom or in this audience to steal said book. But that says a lot to me that if someone is gonna go into a library searching for something and they find our book and they just accidentally on purpose forget to bring it back, may it bring them solace. May they find themselves within the pages of a book. And if their story's not in here, maybe they'll write it themselves. Maybe they'll write their own book. We're also in a library at a university at a time where educators are told what they're not supposed to read when books are banned, when books are censored, when, when books are burned. And in these auspicious times when, when people are afraid to speak freely in classrooms, in the halls of academia, it has taught me a lesson about the importance of, of standing up and speaking up and speaking out. And that lesson was taught to me not by a professor at a university, not by somebody who has fancy degrees. It was taught to me, ironically, by someone who never even graduated from high school. Her name was Renee Firestone. She lived in a war-torn country during the Holocaust. She took a cattle car to Auschwitz and never got to graduate, never got to go to college never got to use academia as a way to tell her story. But when she met the Freedom Riders, she says, evil prevails when the good people do nothing. And then she looked at my students and said, you no longer have the luxury of standing idly by. In a culture and a community that told my students that snitches get stitches and what happens in your home stays in the home. Suddenly, a woman who didn't look like them or talk like them or even come from the community they came from was their teacher, was giving them a mandate and a mission to use a voice because she knew what it was like for those that didn't. So I want to introduce you to one of my students. You just saw him in that NBC, NBC clip. And I was able to put him on a plane, fly him across the country to, to be on this show, on the Today Show. And he was terrified. They came in and they put makeup on him and he got a little frazzled. And he got to sit on a stage with all of these folks that he'd watched on a, on a small television with rabbit ears in his home all those years ago. And suddenly he's taking us all back to a moment, a moment in my class when things weren't right and, and things weren't normal. That young gentleman's name is Carlos, and on the streets, he was referred to as Idol, like American Idol. And what I found out about him was not through a test or a score or from him raising his hand. What I found out about him was told to me in a very toxic teacher's lounge that Carlos was about to get kicked out. They were waiting and plotting because as a graffiti artist, Carlos had the ability to write his name, Idol, on a podium, on a chair, on a desk, on a wall, on a locker. And so our teachers had reached it, their, their max potential, and they were going to kick him out. So they told me on that very first day, if Carlos reaches for that pen, if he reaches for that Sharpie, send him to us and we're going to send him away. And I want to think about that, this idea of, of sending people away. Where do they where do they go? And how do we expect people to just be invisible, to be on the margins?
to be part of a school to prison pipeline. So I didn't want to send Carlos away. And on that first day, I learned about a, a second student. His, his name was Sherrod. Sherrod had also been sent away from every class and every school in our community that he ever attended since kindergarten. In fact, Sherrod had just been sent away from his last English class because he brought a gun to threaten his previous English teacher. And I am on his roster. In fact, Sherrod and Carlos are in the same class on my first day, my very first class. So I left that to toxic teacher lounge and I kept thinking, what is it gonna be like when I reach my room? Will there be separation? Even though in the halls of academia, we learned that separate is never equal. And sadly, there was a young gentleman who just left, who was here this evening, who said, the schools here in Rochester are segregated as well. So how do we change that? How do we fix that? How do we have courageous conversations that separate is not equal in our own hallways, in our own schools, in our own states? So Carlos walked down our hallway that was segregated and separated. And he separated himself from Sherrod, his, his known enemy, his nemesis. And then something happened. He raised his hand. And when he raised his hand, I actually thought he was going to flip me off. He did not. <laughs> he raised his hand and he had a legitimate question. He said, Ms. G. And at first I kind of winced and I thought, why isn't he trying to pronounce my last name right? My last name is Gruel, and he didn't even attempt to pronounce my name. But I quickly found out if you are an OG in the LBC, it's a sign of respect. And the LBC is Long Beach, California. So Miss G has become my teaching moniker, my nickname for my entire teaching career. But he raised his hand and he said, Miss G, do you think I was an ugly baby? And I actually thought that Ashton Kutcher was going to leap out from a curtain and punk me and tell me that I was on MTV. And I said, no, Carlos, there is no such thing as an ugly baby. To which she said, well, I must have been, or why else would I have been abandoned when I was seven years old? And I had that light bulb you see in a cartoon, that, that aha moment, that pit in my stomach, knowing that this young boy spent every single day searching, searching for self, searching for where he was going to sleep on a park bench, on someone's couch, in the corner of an alley, searching for what he was going to wear, <laughs> hand-me-downs that were torn and tattered and shoes that had cardboard at the bottom of those sneakers, searching for what he was going to eat if he got to school early and, and got that free breakfast or ditched his buddies at lunch and had that free lunch. But what happens at night on weekends when there's no school? Do you stand outside of McDonald's with a cardboard box that says, we'll work for food? Do you have a coins that are thrown at you in a cup? Do you hope and pray for humanity and a half eaten burger? Or do you go without? So in that moment, as Carlos asked that question, I realized there was so much more to a story, so much more. And then something happened. Out came a, a piece of paper. Out came this drawing with a horrible racist caricature. And on the side was a directive. It said, pass me. And, and off it went like a blaze. And as this note went up and down the rows, there was laughter and there was fist bumps and there was high fives. And then that note, that horrible racist caricature got into the hands of Sherrod. And this tough kid, he wasn't so tough after all. I think I felt the, the lump in his throat. I think I saw the tears welling in his eyes. And in that moment, I realized that if I don't make sense of this madness, the bell's going to ring. And in a community that just had 126 homicides, in a community that just had a racial reckoning with the Rodney King verdict and those riots, if I don't make sense of this madness, 
these kids are going to leave this classroom and outside that door it's fisticuffs and in the center of our school there's going to be some kind of rumble and in the center of our city on those streets those kids aren't going to be reaching for a gun or a hand they're going to be reaching for each other trying to destroy and demolish and take down and sadly in that fist or with that gun we might lose another life we might have another homicide. We might have another baby killing a baby. The 127th loss in a city that clearly had lost too many lives. So in that moment, I'm, I'm yelling and I'm screaming and I'm trying to make sense of the madness. And as I'm yelling and screaming, I, I tried to reference the, the worst inhumanity that I could muster. The artists during the Holocaust who drew horrible propaganda, the Nazi soldiers who tried to systematically and systemically destroy. And as I'm yelling and screaming like Medusa with snakes in my hair, I started referencing the Holocaust. And out of nowhere, yet again, Carlos raised his hand and simply asked, what is that? What is that word you just used? What is the Holocaust? I'm an English teacher, not a historian. I'm not Jewish and neither are my students. But at that moment, I realized if I don't stop and teach to them and with them, not at them, that the madness is gonna continue. So at that moment, everything had to stop so that everything could start over again. So I wanna introduce you to Carlos not Carlos of the then, a young boy who was searching for self and where to sleep and, and what to eat, but Carlos of the now. Carlos, who's an author. Carlos, who is a businessman. Carlos, who graduated and went to college and owns his own business and is a baller. Callers, a baller and a badass. And I say that lightly, but I also say that endearingly because Carlos came to our office, sat in front of our chalkboard to make this video. And when he arrived, he arrived in a brand spanking new BMW. For context, I'm a teacher. I drive a 2007 Prius. <laughs> Carlos arrived in a brand new BMW with that swagger, with that edge. And I said, Carlos, you know, sit in front of this camera, look into the camera and speak to students. Sit right here, take off your shades and imagine making a difference. And I, I tell you about the shades because you're not gonna see the Ray-Bans. You're not gonna see the sunglasses he usually dons because I wanted you to see Carlos, that tender boy that I met, that tender boy who was broken, that tender boy that had to be put back together again. And that tender boy who still has that hope in humanity. So Carlos is going to take you into my classroom. The, the background will be our film. And he's going to tell you about that moment. The note. The inhumanity. Sherrod. And how these two enemies have become the best of friends. And without wearing the shades, without his superhero powers with those Ray-Ban sunglasses, you can actually see the tears well in his eyes. You can actually see the lump in his throat and you can actually see my classroom. So this is Carlos.
So I got to introduce Carlos via the video to the students at East today. And I wish I could have spent more time. I, I feel like I, I need to come back. Maybe I need to bring Carlos here to, to Rochester. But in that moment with, with Carlos of the then and Carlos of the now, there's been this arc, this journey. I would have never expected a student that I was supposed to send away would be the same student ambassador that I would take all the way to the Middle East, working with Palestinians and Israelis. Because Carlos of the then, who had an in enemy by the name of Sherrod, is now best friends with Sherrod. And Carlos and Sherrod have found their voice. In fact, Sherrod is a teacher at the same school he was kicked out of, right next to that housing project. Carlos is, I love that you're clapping. I know, right? <laughs> Our story is really a, a story about change and about hope and potential. And we've got hope and potential in this front row. Scholars, promise and potential. So what happened in my room was my students had to learn to put down their fist, pick up a pen and write. And that's kind of scary when what you're writing about is the things you've experienced and you've experienced them when you were a kid and you stop being a kid. So for a lot of my students, they saw things they, they shouldn't see. They heard things they shouldn't hear. They stopped being a kid and had the weight of the world on their shoulders. So I wanted them to write. I wanted them to tell. I wanted them to speak things into existence. And so what I did is I did things that were a little outside of the box. I, I closed my door. I learned quickly how to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> and I started taking these bold risks. How can we meet a Holocaust survivor on a Sunday? How could we go to a museum on a day off? How could I work a, a couple extra jobs and get my students books? They've never read a book from cover to cover, but how can I actually buy them a book that is theirs and it's not torn and tattered with mildew, but it's theirs. So I love that all of you have books. And I love that so many of the students at East High today got books as well. The first book I bought my students was The Diary of Anne Frank. The second was Night. The third was about a young girl in Bosnia Herzegovina who had been hailed as the modern day Anne Frank and in the midst of the madness, in the midst of a modern day genocide, while Anne had been in an attic, Slata Filipovich was in a basement writing, writing about those moms, writing about that fear, writing about the grownups who were acting like kids and those kids who had to suddenly be adults. Suddenly, my students realized that maybe we have something to say. Maybe we have something to write and to start practicing what their stories were. We, we played a game that was actually anything but. I called it the line game. And what it was, was stripping my classroom of everything that felt like academia, a desk and a chair, a pen and a pencil, a textbook, scores and labels because for so many of my students, they already had been labeled before they walked in. So many of my students have been called names as such as dumb or stupid or nothing. And I wanted to flip the script. I wanted to change that paradigm and that pedagogy and to tell them they were brilliant. They were beautiful and they were amazing. They, right here in the front row, are perfect and beautiful and amazing. And so in the middle of my classroom, I just put a piece of tape and I began to ask questions, silly, then serious. Questions about pop culture, a, a song or a movie, and then serious about struggle, about poverty, about their homes, secrets, and sometimes shame. And in asking those questions, my students kept coming, coming to the line and standing toe to toe and knee to knee with someone they didn't know, 
And suddenly there was a glance, there was an acknowledgement, there was this familiarity. I'm, I'm not alone in this world. We're standing together. At the end of this game with questions that were harrowing and heartbreaking, I started realizing how heroic my students were because no matter how bad the problem was, they were still standing and they were standing in solidarity with one another. Questions about heartbreak, questions about abuse, questions about fathers that were there or were not, questions about things they had seen that shouldn't be in any home at any time. But the last question I asked was about loss, general loss in a city that had buried fathers and friends. Most of my students had been to more funerals than birthday parties. The last question I asked was stand on the line if you've lost somebody to senseless violence. And every single student stood on that line. Today at East High, in a small room with a group of kids, I asked a similar question and I gave them the opportunity to stand on a line if they too had lost somebody to either violence or a virus. And they did. And then I rattled off one and they stood. If you've lost more than two and they continued to stand. And there was a group of students at East High today who continued to stand, who had lost four or more. Four or more, and they are 14. And that creates a movie in your mind that you can't just stop or pause or eject. That creates trauma and triggers when you're 14 and you have to do a chemistry assignment or a geometry assignment or write that perfect five paragraph essay. So when my students said to me, Ms. G, I feel like I live in an undeclared war zone. I understood war because my brother was a soldier, but my brother was in foreign soil. And we lived 30 minutes from Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. But these students didn't have rides and roller coasters. These students were dodging bullets and missives. So I wanted to take that pain of those questions. I wanted to take that pain that brought them to that line and give them the opportunity to wipe a slate clean. To do so, I wanted to have what we called it a toast for change, to pick up a plastic champagne glass and wipe the slate clean. And to do so, I, I stole a cue from a friend of mine who is a kindergarten teacher, because let's face it, kindergarten teachers are just much more fun. And I have this image that when kindergarten teachers walk, flowers magically sprout at their feet, butterflies are, and birds are chirping and floating and flipping. And so I decided we're gonna take it back in the day when little kids love school and there was wonder and wishes, their first crushes show and tell because for most of my students they missed out on all that maybe they didn't have anything to show maybe a proud mother told them don't you dare tell so we were going to go back old days and have this show and tell and we would be the prize so I blew up some balloons I, I made some silly signs I went out got plastic champagne glasses sparkling apple cider I had books on the ready and in they came. And in that moment, in that moment of this toast for change, my idea was my students will pick up this plastic champagne glass filled with sparkling apple cider and they will make a toast that they will pick up that book I just bought them and read it from cover to cover. They will pick up that plastic champagne glasses with sparkling apple cider and they will actually write the perfect five paragraph essay. They will pick up that plastic champagne glass and pick up that pencil and bubble in all the right answers. For me, change was a score. It was statistics. It was teaching to a test. Until one of my students stood up and made me realize, don't teach to a test. Teach to me. Because kids are not one size fits all. And that kid who did it 
had an ankle monitor, had been in juvenile hall. So when she picked up that plastic champagne glass, it had nothing to do with a test or a pen or a number two pencil. She said, I don't want to be pregnant by the time I turn 15 like my mama. And I don't want to be behind bars for the rest of my life like my daddy. And I don't want to be six feet under by the time I turn 18 like my cousin. I want to change. And in that moment, it gave each and every kid the opportunity to pick up a plastic champagne glass and to get real. They were tired. They were tired of being poor. They were tired of being picked on. They were tired of eating government cheese. They were tired of pushing people away and pushing things down. And as each and every kid made this declaration into the universe about some kind of change, a part of me panicked. I'm not a counselor, a social worker, or a therapist. I didn't even know how to work the copy machine. I thought, how am I gonna help these kids change? But if I can't, maybe my girl Anne Frank can. What I did not realize is not only could Anne Frank be a muse, but they could be each other's. Because what happened was on that day of that line game, a young boy walked up to my desk, picked up a, a marble journal and a ballpoint pen and went to a really dark place. And he wrote, he wrote about being with a single mom from Pittsburgh. He wrote about coming to LA without two pennies to rub together, jobs or a place to live. He wrote about that eviction notice. He wrote about being homeless. He wrote about the shame and the fear of going to school without new shoes, new jeans, no new haircut. Will they know? Will they laugh? And on that moment, when suddenly we're making these declarations, that young student wanted all of us to know that he didn't want to be like his father. The reason they were homeless in the first place. So just like Carlos, I want to introduce you to this student. His name is Narada. He's from Pittsburgh. And when that mom got pushed down that flight of stairs and had that purple eye from, from being sucker punched and she looked at her boy, she grabbed him by the hand and she realized, I don't want you to be like that father. Grabbed her boy, grabbed a bag, came to LA in the hopes and dreams of starting over. In this journey, Narada had the ability to do just that by standing on a line and declaring that he'd been homeless, by picking up a pen and writing in a journal. And in fact, for the young folks who got books tonight, his story is diary number 24 in our book. And when they made this into a movie, they used Narada's words word for word. So I asked Narada to take all of you back, back to that line, back to that classroom, back to that toast, and back to the ability for us to write ourselves into existence. Back to that ability to write your story that allows you to think about a different ending to your own story. So this is Narada taking the two most poignant moments in my class, a line and a toast and bringing them to life.
Narada is a father, has a home, and, and spoke it into existence. And I think that's what all of us that are here tonight are hopeful of, that we can take our story. It makes us stronger. It makes us superheroes. And so my hope is in the next 15 minutes to take our story and, and hold up a mirror to your story. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some stories from Zoom, some stories from this room, and hopefully bring them to life for all of you. And so Michael is going to help us ask some questions. Some of those questions are going to come in just from you raising your hand. And some of those questions are going to be typed into the Q&A on Zoom. So Michael, I'm going to let you go ahead and moderate. And as those questions come in, just throw them my way. Well, I'm going to ask you the first question, Aaron. And I've heard you speak a dozen times, 20 times, and I'm still crying. <laughs> what was that inspiration and how did you know what to do? Because there it was, the key moment, and you did it. A lot of it was fear. The inspiration was a fear. And, and all the educators in the room, we, we know that when we just have that, that, that instinct. Um, I didn't learn most of the things that I did in my class in college. I didn't learn them in my, my teaching career. I just wanted to connect. I just wanted my students to find a safe space and in that safe space to start over, to take those Fs and those Ds and turn them into As. One of my students had a 0.6 GPA when they started their journey with me. Four years later, my students stayed with me from their freshman year through their senior year. And four years later, that student graduated with a perfect 4.0. First in their family to graduate, first in their family to go to college, and she is now in graduate school. And I love as my students keep ascending, some of them have PhDs. One of my favorite stories is that one of my students was undocumented and got everything right, every gold star, every medal, every ribbon. And when it was time to graduate, she was ready to go off because her love affair was not with her English teacher and words. Her love affair was with biology and science. She wanted to be a doctor. And upon graduation, she realized I'm undocumented. I, I don't have a social security number. We clearly can't afford to send me off to school. And so in, in the Freedom Rider world, we believe in the marathon, not always the sprint. And so she just started medical school. It took some time, it took a lot of patience and perseverance, but I can't wait for her to put on that white robe. And the kind of doctor she wants to be is the kind that speaks to those patients in their language, because she was always the translator for her parents. So when she puts on that white robe, uh, that white coat and that stethoscope, that's exactly where she wants to be. Talking to mothers about their kids, talking to fathers about their kids. So I think that inspiration for me is how do I get that student to not give up? It's gonna take a little bit more time. It's gonna take a little bit more elbow grease, but I just didn't want them to give up. Thank you, Erin. Questions from the group here? Let's start with one of our scholars in the front row. Do any of you, Tabitha, I'm going to, I'm going to call out Tabitha. Uh, for those of you that can't see at home, Tabitha has applied to like every Ivy League and she's sitting next to her best friend and they've decided they want to be roommates. Fingers crossed at Hamilton College. So I'm going to call you out, Tabitha, because you have a gold star on your face, <laughs> which means you're a gold star kind of gal. So I'd love for you to ask a question, maybe about students here in Rochester, um, maybe about how my students and your students are more similar than they are different. <laughs> That's time to think of a question. Um... Like, have you ever had a student that, like, didn't react to your, like, empathy and, like, didn't catch on to your, you know, your, um, your light per se? Like, Ooh. how do you react to somebody, like, you're trying to help and they don't want to receive it? So I want to reiterate, uh, Tabitha's question for those that are on, on Zoom and, and can't hear her. 
And I love that you even know what empathy means. I love that you know about light. I will tell you, my students didn't know what to do with me. They thought I was a cheerleader from hell. Music is blaring and I'm standing there at the door welcoming and receiving and, and wanting hugs and handshakes. And they thought, this woman is cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. Like, what is she doing? And, and honestly, all these years later, um, all of those students that started this journey with me are still with me decades later. So, you know, we just made those videos of, of Narada and Carlos. I'm going to see them this weekend. So it's, they haven't gone too far away, but most of them didn't know what empathy was or compassion. Um, they push people away and they push things down. And so now when you see us, we all go in for the hug. Now, when you see us, my, my grown men are not afraid to show that tender side and cry but it was a dance and they had to learn to trust me and they had to realize I'm, I'm not going anywhere. And I, I love that they now have these hearts that are so huge that they let other people in because we, we opened our door for the family and, and wrote a new book called Dear Freedom Writer, kids of the now, kids of your generation. And the freedom writers had to become the cheerleaders for, from hell for these kids send us a letter and we'll respond. Trust us with your story and we'll be there for you to get to the other side. Come out of the darkness and let us be the light together. So I, I think we both learned. I became more of a student and they became more of a teacher. So online, there's a question. Okay. You taught them in one class. How did you convince the other teachers to work with these kids so they could graduate? What was really hard is my students had been called some of the, the worst comments you could say to a student. Um, they were dumb, they were stupid, and they were nothing. And, and even saying those words out loud in, in academia, in this prestigious place, in this prestigious room, is, is really hard to utter. And so sadly, there were people at my school, in my profession, who had already written them off, who had already labeled them and, and made them feel unwanted and unteachable. And I, I don't like the term at risk. I have a friend who uses the word at promise. And so I wanted every one of my students to realize that just because you've done something bad, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. And so my hope was that they would leave my class and that would carry over into the other classes. So it did because a student that got a 0.6 GPA to go to a 4.0 had to get A's in every class. But it started in room 203. It became this epicenter of who's good in math, who's good in science, who's good in English, and how can we become the family that we want to make and the family that we want to choose. So the Freedom Riders started helping each other and they realized in this sacred space, we can help each other pull up those grades, make a difference. Wow. Um, any other questions from the group? Yes. Back row. I have one question. And that question is, once your students actually left your classroom, how were they able to feel safe and protected after being so vulnerable? Because they were already stereotyped. And they had to go back into the same communities and they were very, they were, they were still young people. So what was a way in which that you were able to help them as they became their instructor? I'm so glad you asked that. The question for those that couldn't hear was how, how did you help those students feel safe there, but also when they weren't in that classroom? And that's a double-edged sword because I think as educators or parents or professionals, we just want to make everything feel safe. So room 203 was their haven. They got there early, they left late. And ironically, our office for the last 20 years is actually in a home. And in that home, they could come and there's food and there's laundry and it's safe. But the world isn't always safe. So you met sweet Narada. And Narada was invited with me to go to a community not very far away from here in Watkins Glen. And he flew in to Syracuse to meet me. And we did a couple of schools. And then we made that drive. And sadly, when Narada <clears throat> went into the restroom, people kind of looked at him kind of funny at the first rest stop. And when Narada went to purchase something, they sized him up and down. 
And then they refused to serve him. And then Narada just got in the car and we kept driving and things had changed. And this was just right before the pandemic. And I said, Narada, what's happening? What's going on? Did, did something happen at that rest stop? And when Narada started talking to me about the looks and the stares and the clutching of pearls and the grabbing of a purse and refusing to serve, it made me mad and it made me bristle. And I wanted to go back to that rest stop and I, and I wanted to like accuse everyone of, of not treating him with the dignity that he deserves. And so that's what's hard is when we, when we go out into the world, sometimes it's not safe. But what happened on the other end is, is we went into a school and we saw kids who were wearing shirts that were not very kind. And he heard things that were not very kind. I said, Narada, throw the gauntlet down. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's have a courageous conversation right here, right now. Let's talk to the superintendent who brought us. Let's talk to the principal who asked us to come. And in this very community, we want these kids to know what happened to you so they never do it to someone else. And we did. And there was tears and it was complicated and it was confusing at first. And by the time each and every one of those kids left, they realized that could have been a mom or a dad, but at least it wasn't us. But the next time it happens, if you're standing there, you no longer have the luxury of standing idly by in the same way that freedom writers no longer have the luxury of standing idly by when evil prevails. So I think it's incumbent on all of us when we hear something to say something, when we see injustice, we do something that we know names and we know stories and <clears throat> when there's moments that create righteous indignation, we stand a little taller and we give a voice to the voiceless. And so I'm glad at that moment, Narada didn't have a voice at that rest stop. But in that school, he had a voice and hopefully he paid it forward to someone else to stand a little taller. So a great question. And for those of you that don't know, Christine is gonna be a teacher. She, you have a master's and I think you're not just gonna be a teacher. You wanna like run the joint. I think you wanna be a principal or a superintendent. So I'm just gonna speak that into existence. It's, it's just a matter of time till maybe you invite Narada back and you roll out the red carpet for him. So Kim says we have like one more minute. So what, what's the one message you want to give to teachers and to all of us as educators? I don't think we could boil it down to one, but I, I think that I was told by uh, someone that you may be one person in the world, but you may be the world to one person. And, and with that cliche of, of being the world to one person, that could be your son or daughter. It could be your students. It could be the people in this very room. I think it's really important how we hold ourselves, how, how, we, how we communicate, how, how we lean in. We live in a time where people go to their gadgets and I, I will see a group of teenagers and they're all on their phones and they're posting on their social media feeds. They're not actually having a conversation. They're not actually engaging and in the moment, but they're posting it as if they are. I think we gotta put down our gadgets. I think we gotta be in the moment and be intentional. I think we have to lean in and to listen. And so my hope is what, whatever our profession is, whatever brought us to this space tonight, that we leave here really seeing people. That's what the Freedom Riders did. They really saw one another on that line and stood in solidarity in the silence. They really listened when other Freedom Riders picked up a plastic champagne glass and made a toast to change and then held them to account. So I think it's important for us to see, it's important for us to hear, it's important for us to treat every human being like they matter. So I thank all of you here this evening that treated these incredible scholars, uh, that they are worthy of being at a university of this magnitude and that you were gonna pay your good fortune forward to them. So thank you for allowing me to come and share our missions. When you are the superintendent, please invite us back. Uh, Narada will get all gussied up. Narada will have those, those dramatic dialogues with your students and he will be a humble servant.
So thank you for allowing me to come and share. Closing comments. I want to thank Aaron for coming. Uh, that was a moving and inspirational speech and keynote. Um, and also, thank you for doing what you do um, in highlighting, you know, the positivity that there is out there, and with these young students and scholars, uh, reminding us to do uh, why we're why we're doing what we do. Uh, as a quick reminder, if you would like a signed copy of Aaron's book, you can purchase a copy here tonight. She will be staying afterwards in the other room to sign copies. Uh, the next Le Neely Author Series lecture will be Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. We will be welcoming Dana Bowen Matthew, who is a JD and PhD. Dana is the Dean and Harold H. Green Professor of Law at George Washington University, a leader in public health and civil rights who focuses on disparities in health, health care, social determinants of health. Dean Matthew joined GW Law in 2020. She is the author of the best-selling book, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequities in American Healthcare, and recently released Just Health, Treating Structural Racism to Heal America. It is the co-author of a case book on public health law and policy. Uh, please check the Neely Author Series website. And Stay afterwards and thank you. And thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Michael.